Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alibaba Cloud Asia Forward Startup Day, organized by Alibaba Cloud. This event is designed to be a full day of interactive activity and dialogue with Asia's leading VCs, Southeast Asian startups of all stages, and notable Chinese startups to discuss the opportunities in the region's hottest sectors. During the panel today, the guest speakers will share their experiences and learnings from the past decade of rapid growth and development in Asia, particularly addressing the similarities and differences between the business and innovation contexts of Southeast Asia as well as China. We've also collected some questions from the audience. Our speakers will answer them at the end of each panel, so stay tuned. Moving on, let's talk about pushing the adoption of robots in Southeast Asia and China. I'm Chun Yu, Director of Maju Robotics and your moderator for today's robotics panel. Let me introduce our guests. We have Jeff Lin, Senior Principal at iGlobe Partners, and we have Sally Yang, Co-Founder of Amy Robotics. A warm welcome to you both. Thank you for your time and support. So let's get into it. Uh, thank you, Chen Yue. Thank you for having me on the panel today. Very nice to see both you and Sally. Um, my name is Jeff. Um, I'm a senior principal in iGo Partners, a cross-border VC firm based in Singapore. I've been with iGo for more than eight years. Before I became a VC, I was in the strategy consulting business, uh, working for Lauren Berger in various countries, including Myanmar, Bangladesh, Singapore, and in, in Indonesia. Prior to that, I was with Huawei for five years. I was the first country manager for Huawei's in the price business in Singapore before I left for B school in 2011. I also worked for Lockheed in China and Hutchinson in Hong Kong in the earlier part of my career. Here at iGroup, I'm part of the investment team. In my job, um, I source deals. Um, I see on the board of some of the companies we invested in, including those in Singapore, Taiwan, Indonesia, and also in the US. The final pay letter company, Hula, uh, is one such example. iGroup invests in both Southeast Asia and the Western world. We are very active in Singapore. Indonesia and the Philippines. We're also very active in the US and Europe. And I group supports our portfolio companies in the international expansion, be it a US company such as Unity or Metapod coming to Asia or a Southeast Asian company such as Swap Mobility expanding to Japan or other regions. At I group, our investment focus uh, include FinTech, Smart City, Digital Health and Synthetic Biology because of mandate in smart city, we do look into the field of uh, robotics, smart manufacturing, and various enabling technologies related to mobility. For example, I also enjoy investing in the LIDAR company, Silicon Valley. In a portfolio, in a portfolio we have an industrial drone company in Japan. This company called ACSL is in the field of UAV, or a main aerial vehicle, and the visual slam technologies uh, is among the best in the world. Over to you. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Right. So uh, next, uh, we have uh, Sally from Amy Robotics. Uh, incidentally, Amy is uh, nominated as a guest speaker for today's panel. Hello, Sally. Can Hello. you introduce yourself and your company, please? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, uh, let me uh, brief introduce myself. I'm Sally, and uh, I was major in computer science and uh, technology. Then I joined in Motorola. And I worked there for 10 years. Uh, after that, uh, I attended a program of global entrepreneurship uh, of Zhejiang University. And uh, after that, I worked in a BOCO for one year. And uh, then uh, we started Emmy Robotics. Emmy uh, uh, Robotics was founded in year 2015. Uh, we are a high technology innovation company uh, specialized in R&D and sales uh, for artificial intelligent robots. Uh, we have a service robot and uh, two types uh, and uh, six models of disinfection robot. And uh, also we have a delivery robot. Um, besides, we provide the customer the total uh, solutions like uh, intelligent hospital. And we also uh, offer customization uh, to small or big companies uh, who have uh, marketing channel and they want their own intelligent robot. 
Uh, since uh, establishment, we have completed uh, three rounds of fundings. Uh, uh, the existing shareholders include uh, Zhou Jiang, Ke Chuang, uh, Ying Jiang, and the uh, Function Fund. Thanks for Alibaba Cloud for inviting us to this event. We have been using Alibaba Cloud service since 2015, and it has been stable and smooth which is a great support for our robot business. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you uh, both to Jeff and Sally. Uh, very impressive. Uh, uh, so Sally, perhaps uh, you can start by sharing with, the, with us what you've seen in China from the recent years regarding the growth of uh, robot use. Uh, okay, uh, at home now, uh, more and more families have sweeping robot. And uh, I, I found uh, the price of, the, of it is uh, now it's only a quarter or even lower than at the beginning. And uh, in industry, you can see, you can easily see a delivery robot working. Uh, just uh, um, go to a medium-sized restaurant, you can see it's working there. Uh, and uh, for some 2G and 2, 2B area, uh, the service robot, the usage of service robot is very common. And uh, the decision-making for a uh, purchase robot uh, is, uh, more, more quick. Uh, maybe several years ago, customer will uh, spend one year to decide whether or not to buy a service robot, but now it can be in, in one week. Uh, and and uh, there are, I think the market is uh, maturing uh, and more and more uh, competitors joining this industry. The service robot company in China for uh, last year is uh, 100,000. 100, uh, it is three times than in year 19, uh, 2019. Right, thank you. Thank you, Sally, for sharing. So, um, Jeff, what about you? Uh, what trends have you observed in the recent years? Oh yeah, probably I can talk a bit more from Southeast Asia kind of perspective, right? So, so here in Southeast Asia, I feel, um, the adoption has been uh, kind of accelerated, right? So, and it both actually the uh, so industrial and service robot kind of a segment, um, especially so for Singapore. In my uh, view, right, there are a few key drivers actually uh, for the theoretical adoption of such uh, robots in the past few years. The first is uh, the shortage of labor, especially for the construction sector and the FMB industry, um, which is worsened due to the pandemic over the past two years. The shortage of labor further drove up the uh, labor costs and strengthened the business case for deploying robots. The second driver is Industry 4.0, uh, which is happening not only in China, but also in part of Southeast Asia. Industry 4.0 calls for higher level automation, and the benefit of automation is to allow uh, plants to operate 24 by 7. And to address such demand in Asia, companies such as Siemens even set up the once manufacturing transformation center or AMTC uh, to provide uh, guidance support to, to SMEs uh, in, the, in this field. And as a driver is the need to use robot to replace human beings in those uh, dangerous or risky kind of assignments or those repetitive kind of uh, assignments that human beings uh, generally don't like to do. I'll give one example. Uh, under the building so-called uh, regulation in Japan, companies are required to perform a uh, yearly inspection of the interior structure of factory buildings for those buildings over certain uh, years of age. And every year in Japan, there will be human inspectors falling off from later or scare food, and some even lost their lives. So you will replace human inspectors with um, industrial drones, uh, which can fly autonomously to, to capture image in the indoor environment. And such casualties can be uh, avoided. So portfolio company ACSL has a few models of drones actually which can uh, fly autonomously uh, in a GPS denied indoor environment. And um, it also has a drone which can fly in, uh, in switch pipe for ins uh, conduct ins inspection which a switch pipe is typically a place nobody want to, to go into, right? So, so these kind of applications I feel actually um, are quite real. And here in Singapore, we have seen hospitals using the uh, UV disinfection robots uh, we also see laboratory kind of robots um, use actually in transporting biological samples and using such robots uh, can not only boost the productivity, but also help to keep the workers from 
uh, potential hazards, right? So in Singapore, we have seen a lot of uh, restaurants adopted um, uh, food delivery robots, uh, which can deliver dish uh, from kitchen to the table. So one example is a restaurant called the Bonding Kitchen on the Orchard Road, right? So this is a Nyonya restaurant. Singapore is the right market for, for such service robots um, because our manpower cost is quite high. And um, some of the service robots are deployed in Singapore. Actually, I can see in the record, local restaurants or the food courts actually are, are either from China vendors or from Singapore local startup companies, right? So another driver is uh, the government subsidy or grant, right? So this is more applicable for enterprise customers in Singapore. In September 2021, the government announced a joint project initiated by BC at IMDA, uh, which allows for construction companies to receive up to 80% uh, financing to adopt the box and um, automatic automation solutions. There are also a few other local startups in building uh, special kind of robots for construction use, right? So I here because IGO is a VC firm, right? So I also see some of these startup companies. Uh, I used to make um, an NTU professor actually who invented a, a cement mopping so called machine. Actually, we can mop cements on the world um, actually very quickly and also with better quality. There's also another company, Singapore company, in the field of uh, lower and roof painting, right? So here's some examples I can share with you. Over to you, Chen Yip. Wow. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing uh, the, the trends that you've seen. Uh, it's really uh, very impressive. And I think uh, the uh, adoption of robots is really just going to uh, increase from here. Right. Uh, so now uh, the next uh, question is for Sally. Right. Uh, was there a specific point in time where you saw an increase in the adoption of robots in China besides during the pandemic? Uh, yes, in, uh, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2020, when the um, pandemic uh, comes, the, the requirement, the request for uh, disinfection robot was boomed. Uh, we all, all the stock, uh, we are sold out of stock. Yeah, I mean, the customer need more, more robot, but we do not have. And then several months later, the uh, delivery robot used in a restaurant uh, more and more. And uh, I think uh, in uh, last year, the request for service robot was start boom. Yeah, I think uh, this is the, uh, the point, time point. Right. Okay, but uh, were there any challenges in, um in building uh, customer adoption or breaking um, their preconceived uh, ideas about robots? At the, uh, at the beginning, uh, customer uh, do not know uh, how, how the technology can do, and uh, they do not know how to, how to uh, use the robot. Um, I, I remember we received many uh, uh, weird requirements, uh, like, uh, and they want uh, the robot to uh, detect the uh, human emotions and uh, they want a robot to can, uh, can solve a patient, like uh, feed them food and uh, help them put on the clothes. And that's very difficult uh, for, for current technology. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, I hope uh, these uh, challenges are addressed uh, soon and we can have uh, very impressive robots in our midst. Right, uh, thank you, Sally, for sharing. Um, so the next question I have is for Jeff. Um, Jeff, I think we've heard that the uh, hardware startups in Southeast Asia find it difficult to raise funds. Yeah. So as an investor, what are some concerns and questions that you would have when considering investment in robots within Southeast Asia? Sure. Um, it is true that consumer hardware companies uh, in general are and more challenges to fundraise uh, from VCs in this region. So we used to have a couple of hardware accelerators started here a few years ago and some of them actually no longer actually uh, in the mode of operation, right? So, but this is phenomenon for most part of the world, except for the US and China. Consumer hardware companies generally require a lot of working capital and they may face some other challenges such as seasonality uh, for the products as well, right? So one UK company we used to make before is, um, is in education, uh, the bought toys kind of space. And they managed to get the products sold through Apple Store, which is actually by itself quite a big achievement. But unfortunately, I mean, they also rely too much on Christmas season sale, 
right? So this is the kind of problem that you which can be a issues achieved for the growth of the company. However, I do see some successful examples of Southeast Asian companies in hardware space. Uh, like Igru Home is a very successful company in designing and marketing of its smart lock product, right? So coming back to, um, to the kind of concerns and questions we may have um, uh, when considering investing in robot companies in Southeast Asia, I would say, um, I would like to see uh, the product market phase is, is already there and the use cases are strong, right? So we are open to look at any B2B uh, robot solutions for various kinds of verticals. Let me give one example, right? So there's a local company uh, which created a no-code uh, platform, non-technical users to program industrial robots in minutes and they use Unity uh, platform. So things like this are not trying to compete with any existing kind of major industrial robot company, uh, but they can add value to every one of them, right? Um, another thing we'd like to see um, is the company we invest in should have the potential to become a segment leader and expand to other parts of Asia Pacific or even the rest of the world. That is because if the technology capability in the specific domain is not at the top, they probably won't be able to compete effectively in the whole market of Southeast Asia against uh, players like um, uh, those players are from China or Japan or Europe, right? So, so Sally's company actually, I believe is also uh, coming to Southeast Asia. So you really have to, um, to be distinguished enough in, uh, in the particular kind of area application uh, you're working on. Yeah, so that's my five cents of sauce. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. Yeah, as the founder of a kind of a hardware startup myself, uh, I think uh, this is very informative. Thank you for the advice. So um, next, uh, Sally, do you think it would be fair to say that there are more specific demands from both clients and consumers who interact with the robots? For example, needing the robot to smile or project certain emotions when responding to customers? Yes, uh, I think I have just uh, said they maybe uh, need the robot to de detect the, the human motion and uh, they want to do many things the human can, can do, but a robot cannot. Uh, maybe they uh, watch the many movies, uh, but that's, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess uh, you have to manage uh, your customers' uh, expectations of uh, what robots can do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, so next, uh, I think I have a question for the both of you, both Sally and Jeff. So uh, we'll begin with uh, Sally first. Uh, so what is the next generation of consumer-facing um, robots? What excites you about the uh, uh, the industry's future development in terms of uh, robots that are, are supposed to interact directly with consumers? Uh, I think uh, with the development of technology, uh, the cost of the robot will be reduced a lot and uh, more and more area can afford a robot. Uh, I think a robot can help human a lot. Uh, based on robots, navigation, skill, uh, and the uh, moving ability, all the uh, routine carrying, carrying uh, will be done by robot. Uh, besides restaurant, uh, I think uh, the workshop uh, will have robot to carry the uh, materials or the assemb uh, assembly, part assembly or finished goods. And I think in hospitals, uh, robot can help carry uh, like uh, med medicine and uh, surgeon bags and uh, any other areas and all the things, uh, if, if it is carried a routine, the robot can help. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. All right. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, what, is, what are your opinions about uh, the next generation of robots that are supposed to interact directly with uh, consumers? Yeah. So, in Southeast Asia, right, we have seen a few interesting kind of developments, right? Uh, so the most interesting one I've seen so far is the uh, uh, robotic uh, coffee barista from a Singapore company called uh, Crown Digital. Uh, this is a machine which prepares the uh, so uh, gourmet coffee for you without the need to hire a human uh, coffee barista. It, it doesn't have to take too much space and it can be easily deployed uh, in the places of high footage such, such as railway station or MRT stations, right? So JRE of Japan invested in this company and, and intend to deploy it in Japan, actually. And so, so robots like this addresses the hygiene concern 
uh, during the pandemic and will continue to stay even after the pandemic. And this is also a very good example of Singapore local startups in invention can also be recognized by the customers in Western market. So, so in my opinion, uh, when, when it comes to consumer facing robots, right, I would say not every future consumer uh, facing robots have to be humanoid robots. And what really matters is uh, the actual utility such robots um, provide to the customers, right? So markets such as Singapore, Hong Kong, or Japan, with the aging population, and I guess companion robots or robots which can help to uh, senior citizens to improve their quality of life uh, will be a quite interesting area. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So uh, elder care uh, using robots is uh, definitely a very exciting area that we can uh, look forward to. Thank yeah. you, Jeff and Sally, for sharing uh, and also for your insightful um, um, comments. So let's uh, move on to the question and answer and uh, take a look at some of the questions that our audience members have sent in. Now, the first question I have is directed towards uh, Sally. It's from Aura ML. How can robotic startups keep the cost of hardware down? Um, um, for some uh, key part, uh, I remember at uh, your 2000 and. Uh, 16, one laser, the price is uh, 15,000 RMB here. Um, but now we can buy, buy one laser in uh, 1,000. Of the key part is reducing. And uh, besides this, uh, um, uh, I remember for our service robot, we use the uh, one PC and uh, one uh, RK board but, but now we can combine them together. So some parts can be removed. And uh, as more and more people um, buy robots, so uh, we can uh, put uh, production it in bench. Uh, it can also reduce the cost. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sally. Right, so that's very good to know. Um, so I have a question next for Jeff. Um, this question is from Stick M. So have you seen any successful VC-backed startups that focus on robotics education? Okay, sure. Um, so two of the most successful companies in uh, which provide uh, educational uh, robot programs, I know uh, are both uh, established companies. One is uh, Lego, which everyone of you are very familiar with, right? So the other company is a Hong Kong-based company called uh, Vex Robotics. So VEX was founded in 2005 and it provides educational and competitive robots uh, built for schools, universities, and also uh, robotic teams, right? So basically it's a company we built robots for those actually uh, students who want to go and uh, participate in the international competitions. Now, this company didn't raise any VC uh, funding at all based on my knowledge. One relatively successful startup uh, in the education robot space, I, which I can highlight is a company called Wellspot. Um, this is a company based in Shanghai. Another Shenzhen-based company uh, called Makebrock, um, which is also quite successful. They raised uh, more than $80 million. And, and I think the valuation for them back in 2018 was somewhere now 270 or 260 plus million dollars, right? So other than that, actually, it's, uh, if we want to talk about out of China, right? So another company which is relatively successful so, but it cannot be called as a startup. It's a company called Ilobot, right? Ilobot is listed in NASDAQ and it's a market cap of $1.5 billion. This company has a business line focused on the STEM education, right? And um, just three years ago, we acquired a company called Loop Robotics, which is actually exactly in the space of educational kind of robot. But uh, that was not a huge exit for uh, Loop Robotics because this company also didn't uh, raise too much money and didn't have too much traction. So having said that, there are some educational toy companies which have uh, which were well funded but eventually didn't work out. Uh, Ankit is one example. Right, the company died in 2019, and after raising a total, I think 25 million dollar is quite a lot. So, but I do believe uh, there's still a lot of room to play for new form of educational robots or toys, and there are opportunities for those those hardware and cosware creators and uh, those private education school offering such, we call a license kind of a course programs, right? 
at the end of the day, right, we should deem it as some kind of ad tech rather than rather than robot because um, but this is about how to cultivate the children and make them better prepare for STEM education. Whether it's in the form of robot or some other type of toys, um, I think it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, so long as um, so long it gives uh, some kind of value to children and, uh, and parents. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it only makes sense that uh, as the robotics industry grows, then the industry, the side industry for education robotics uh, will also grow together. Yeah, very right. uh, Next, we have a question uh, from O Babu Mashai. This uh, question is directed towards uh, Jeff, right? So the question is, how can Southeast Asian robotics startups build trust among their target users for the use of their products? Sure, I guess my answer will, will be applicable for any of the uh, robotic kind of startup companies, right? So I'm going gonna, gonna to talk from a consumer perspective. Uh, in my opinion, for any robotics or ULV startups, they have to overcome uh, three major hurdles before actually the, the product can be, uh, um, can be trusted by, by, by the public, right? Uh, these three hurdles are number one, safety, Number two, uh, privacy or data protection. Uh, number three is about cybersecurity. So for first, actually in terms of safety, I think this is more, even more so for, for the case of drones or UAVs. Um, and don't forget actually this uh, uh, robot is actually is quite, a, it depends on actually the kind of robot you deploy in a public space, right? It's a moving target, right? It's uh, electrically powered and uh, you may even carry certain components such as a LiDAR or some other things, right? So, so uh, we have to make sure the whole system is, is, uh, is designed in such a way that um, it's really safe enough for, uh, for human beings, especially in the public space. Um, the other day, we were talking to some other so-called uh, friends actually in regards to uh, the potential issues for some of the LIDARs being developed, right? So if you may know that autonomous vehicles uh, asking for even longer range of uh, LiDAR kind of uh, sensing and, and that requires uh, lights of different kind of uh, wavelengths and uh, different kinds of chains. So, so they make sure it actually is forced within the allowed kind of range, which is not going to hurt human eyes or we're not going to hit anybody, right? So this is, uh, uh, we have to address. Uh, number two, in, in terms of privacy and data protection, right? So as you can see, a lot of robots actually they use cameras and um, as an edge computing device, definitely you will process kind of this so-called the images and videos and you have to make sure actually all this data, which is temporary store in the device itself actually is properly handled and the data capture will not, um, will not cause any so-called nuisance to any of the people uh, in the surroundings, right? So this is something, especially even more so, even to have a home robot we're doing housework for you, but then you also have uh, family members at home. We want to make sure everybody's privacy is protected. Number three, cybersecurity. So at the end of the day, um, robot is also um, IoT device by itself, right? I mean, it's connected to the network. And how do you make sure the system is hardened enough that I mean, it's not easily kind of being intruded. Um, you're not going to be actually taken over by someone actually do certain funny things, right? So this applies to UAVs, robotics, uh, vehicles. And, and I think in all three areas, I think there are a lot of interesting problem to be solved and there could be opportunities for startup to create something actually to address this. So here's just my, um, some of my thoughts. Over to you, uh, Chen Ye. All right, thanks, uh, Jeff, yeah. So certainly uh, safety, privacy, as well as cybersecurity are uh, things of concern when uh, we're dealing with um, robots or even IoT uh, products. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, next, I have a question for Sally. Uh, do you think you can share with us uh, your story of the founding of Amy Robotics? What was your initial idea and why did you choose that? Sally? Okay, uh, at the beginning, Actually, uh, we uh, designed a robot, uh, especially for uh, businessmen. They are very busy. Uh, they want to uh, stay at home with their baby or with their uh, elder people, like their uh, parents. Um, 
So we we hope there is a robot uh, can uh, present as them. So our robot have a camera that's that's their eye, and the robot robot can move. Uh, uh, it have a navigation system, so everywhere they want to go at home, the robot can go. And it also has a speaker and uh, had a mic, uh, like uh, their ear uh, and mouse. Uh, that's for uh, the home and uh, uh, in the in the office, it can be uh, served as a um, uh, secretary. Uh, it can uh, record the schedule of the uh, businessman. And when uh, they have a uh, custom comes uh, and the robot can come and uh, uh, take them uh, to the like uh, office. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, the one uh, we sell the service robot uh, and uh, the price of uh, 50,000 50, RMB. Uh, it is um, very, very expensive. And we, uh, we uh, provide a survey the people can accept uh, uh, five thousand, <laughs> so we cannot sell the robot to uh, to home. People work at home, uh, so uh, that's not to C. Then we change it to D. Uh, we sell robot to government. It can uh, it can be uh, worked as a service robot at the uh, front desk. Uh, how to say? <laughs> uh, and. Uh, to a uh, uh, museum and uh, uh, maybe uh, many different kind of uh, business area, but not to, 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 to home. So uh, I have uh, one final question for both speakers. Right? Uh, this question comes from Pound It. So uh, since we're with you, Jeff, uh, perhaps uh, you can tell us, um, do you think robots will be sustainable in the future? Uh, sure. Um, it's been quite a while actually when uh, um, that uh, some investors consider robotics to be part of the ESG investment team, right? Um, robotics and AI are being actively used uh, by companies to achieve goals that are very much in line with UN's uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, for example, precision agricultural robots uh, can help to improve efficiency and uh, address the food shortage a problem and can be a key tool in preventing hunger, which is uh, which is SDG number two um, in the years to come. The other example is uh, the advances in the surgical robot can help improve the quality of the medical procedures and therefore can contribute to achieving SDG three, which is another goal actually under the UN's uh, ESG kind of uh, initiative, right? And this is going to be good for health and uh, the well-being of the human beings, right? So, so in general, people can use robot and AI to make better decisions and, and keep people out of harm. So the, the building inspection example, which highlight I mentioned earlier, is actually um, is actually in line with this uh, story night, right? And I also believe robot can help to make um, the world more sustainable, right? On the other hand. Uh, robot startups can also take measures to make the whole life cycle of the, the products more sustainable uh, by using recycled biodegradable materials or replaceable kind of parts, etc. In regards to such wishes, uh, my view is actually there's no difference between robots and other consumer electronic products you're buying today. And I believe um, SETI actually have a lot of thoughts about this as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. So, um, that's very interesting, um, but I'm also interested to hear uh, what Sally has to say, uh, since uh, Jeff already introduced uh, and, uh, the element of anticipation here. Sally, what do you think? Do you think robots will be sustainable in the future? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I think uh, uh, just like a computer and the mobile phone, I think uh, a robot is uh, uh, like a mobile, mobile phone plus uh, moving, mm -hmm. And it also have a uh, voice interaction and also um, visual. Mm -hmm. I think uh, plus all this technology together or uh, more and more area will use this robot. And uh, this uh, robot will uh, go to every industry. I think it's the future. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, thank you to uh, Sally and Jeff. Uh, that's all the time we have today for the robotics panel. Um, 
I would like to uh, express my appreciation to both speakers for joining us today and our audience for taking the time to tune in. I hope you found this session informative and meaningful. And we hope that you'll stick around for the rest of the day's activities. If not, we wish that uh, you would join us again soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Chen Yue. Uh, very nice to meet you and uh, Sally today, indeed. And uh, also, wish to appreciate. Uh, some appreciation to, to Care Asia and also the Ali Crowd team for hosting the event today. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Ali.